Inside BMX, welcome to the show, Elise Willoughby. I may slip and call you by your old last name, so I apologize in advance. It's okay. It happens a lot. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, do people say the Willow Beast anymore? Um, Grindel on the USA BMX series loves that one um, when he's announcing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I haven't heard it on like the World Cup tour or anything yet. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, okay. So that's we'll where I've heard it. At this. So I see. But I do I, like it. I good one. <laughs> so I see the sun is out and you've got your guns out. Yes. <laughs> is the shirt made of like course. that, or did you, or did you did cut it, or did Sam rip your no, sleeves off? They made them like this. I specifically re requested muscle tanks. You know, they're you gotta have room to move. You know, that's good. That's yeah, good. It's... All right. <laughs> are you? Are you? Are you? From Max, I got the. I got the hookup. Yeah. So, how big <laughs> is your sheltering crew right now? Uh, it's a party of three. It's me and Sam and the dog Mila. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, Anthony was with us, uh, Dean, for a little bit at the beginning. Um, but then obviously with everything changing so rapidly and Australia shutting down borders and all sorts of stuff, um, he went home, uh, pretty quick, uh, once all that went, uh, into effect. Got it. So everyone especially BMXers, um, have been somewhat forced to live inside, which is well outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're all used to being out and about and riding or something other than just sprinting in our street. Um, so given, us given the time to reflect, we kind of gave you a heads up before. But, um, yeah, we're, we're talking, having conversations with the best and brightest about their best most favoritest lap in the UCI BMX Supercross series. What's yours? Well, I was kind of preluding to this to you before we got on the air here about how it's hard to pick because obviously every lap or, and, and for me, I was kind of deciding between the wins because those are obviously the mm -hmm. most fun. Um, but, you know, they all have their own story. And, you know, I could go all the way back to 2012 with the first win in in Papendal, but then, you know, then you go to Sweden, it was after the Worlds, and you go to Papendal, and then you come to Shepherd, and which is this year, which was mm -hmm. amazing, double win, but when I thought about it, and the feelings, and what came with it, I think that the win, and, and lap in Papendal in 2018, um, was probably my favorite lap win, a World Cup win. All right, um, so what's the I've setup for that one? Ah, uh, I think the biggest thing about it was, A, you know, I, I'd earned my first stripes and mm -hmm. I, that was my first World Cup competing in the rainbow jersey and with the Willoughby name. And it was my first World Cup and racing on a supercross track since the Olympics in mm. 26 with everything that had, had gone on. Um, so That's after right. There was a quite a break we'll say <laughs> pause <laughs> yeah i had yeah. a few things going on uh yeah. in that time so um uh, i guess it kind of solidified to me and like i went in like obviously knowing um every time i line up i always want it to win you know like that's the mm -hmm. goal is to execute mm -hmm. and to line up with the mindset uh to win the lap but i think that in that instance, it was, it was, like I said, it'd been a long break. Um, I know I'd watched the girls battling, uh, like crazy over the past few years, they'd switched to the new format of two days of racing and Laura had been racking up wins. I remember mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. you saying she's untouchable. This is pop and doll. And I remember thinking, <laughs> I'm going to prove them wrong. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm so, glad you did that. <laughs> Yeah, no, and it was just fun, you know. Like I said, it was my first World Cup back, and I was competing in the rainbow jerseys with Willoughby on the back, and mm -hmm. my first World Cup is Sam coaching me. And I think that, yeah, going to somebody's backyard, like all those Dutch riders obviously compete well there every year, as as they would. It's and their Between there and Zolder. 
Yeah, and so I think, and and Papendal is a special place in my heart. I've always I've always loved uh, racing there too. Obviously, with my win back in 2012, that was my first World Cup win, and it's Mother's Day weekend, which is a special one. And um, yeah, I think that the premise of it was just that there was a lot of factors going into it that made it kind of solidify. Uh, my mark back on the international scene for me you know we've raced the world championships the year before and I, I'd been able to win without having mm -hmm. raced any other international competition but that was on home soil mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. and I think that was just um, it was a good stepping stone back onto the world world cup circuit yeah and and let's be real I mean Rock Hills I like Rock Hill as a track don't get me wrong but Papendal is like the quintessential supercross track. I mean, there's no, I mean, it's big, it's fast, it's scary. I mean, it, it has all those things that supercross is, you know, so that that's also, an, I think another, I mean, it's to use an old, old pro reference. It's, it's a, it's one of the majors, you know, it's like, yeah. like if you win there, it's like you've arrived kind of thing. Yeah, and I think that, you know, going back out on the last straight and popping all the crowds always big there. They love it. And, um, yeah, we got to catch up with Jelly, I remember, mm -hmm. at that race, too. And there was just, you know, there was a lot of things that were great about that weekend. And it was a fun win. And I, I especially liked watching the the – dad cam footage back from Sam uh, and, and and how excited he was watching because I remember on day one um, I'd gotten probably a better first straight I would mm -hmm. say and then case the triple into the first turn yeah. and, and let Laura up the inside and mm -hmm. obviously she kind of ran away with it then and so I think just correcting those mistakes and and actually I, I qualified first that day and from the semifinal and still went in lane two and just kind of did a mulligan of day one and said, I'm going to get it right. And mm -hmm. I did. So that was, it was cool. Um, and uh, like I said, that was my first time doing the back to back days and I'm glad I, did, I did, Laura, <laughs> did Laura, do you remember who's on the podium? Um, in the end, I think on that day it was me and then Saya Sakakibara yeah. and Judy Bao, I believe. Okay. Um, Laura ended up getting fourth, I think. So that's right. That's right. That yeah, she was battling for like third or fourth, I think, and then it got jumbled on the last straight. Um, she was in second coming out of the first turn, and then, yeah, um, not not too sure I didn't have the rear views on, but I just kind of tried to go. <laughs> right, right. So, and, and it was cool because, you know, watching it back, I had a pretty decent lead from that point and rode a pretty clean lap. I mean, it wasn't perfect by any means, but um, I would say this year I probably almost rode – or in 2019, sorry, I probably almost – rode the track better but you know didn't get the get the victory but at that lap in particular and that that win was pretty memorable right when if at all on that track because you know on, on like a lot of tracks you get to a certain point and you're like okay just finish you know there's like sometimes it's you know you get to the first turn you're like okay i can breathe now sometimes it's maybe after the third straight is there a place on that track where you <laughs> I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna use the word "let up." It's not the right no, word. No, I'm just gonna answer and say no. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> no. On, on these tracks, like when they're big like that, it's like kind of like the Rio uh, replica track that we had here, our London track mm -hmm. in Chula Vista. Like, I always love riding that track, and um, but there's really even when you're trying to like start your day and warm up, it's like maybe take a few runs at the last straight, and then it's like, all right, we're <laughs> full speed. Here we we're go. doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's really no, you can't really hold back and, and get it right. And maybe if you spent more time there, um, like obviously the locals, um, mm -hmm. that would be a bit different. Uh, but, you know, when you're coming in and you get a, a one hour practice before race day, you're, you're kind of just buck, buckled in and you, you're, um, you got to take a deep breath, obviously, everywhere around the track and um, try to remind yourself to stay in that moment mm -hmm. and present on everything because otherwise it it gets busy out there and long and tiring, but I think um, in general, yeah, there's no like, all right, I'm home now. Right, uh, right. It's <laughs> all the way around. That's a, that's an interesting. So on Papendal, what do you? What other than I'm not going to assume. So I'm just going to ask you quick. What what is your best part for you on that track, and what is the part where you're like, okay, just get through this part. <laughs> um. Obviously, I always love first straights, and I love that uh, triple. And just being wide open, I think mm -hmm. it's awesome that it's flat and it allows you to open up on that mm -hmm. first straight. 
Um, so I like that. It caters to me. I I'm just a fan of that. Um, a real say, <laughs> yeah. And then the, uh, I would say, I, I also really enjoy the second straight there. I think it's actually pretty technical how, you know, the jumps are all shaped quite different. I think they've mm -hmm. rebuilt it now, but that steep step up in the middle with the drop down, like it's mm -hmm. actually pretty technical. You're going pretty fast. So that's, Super fast. yeah. So it's, it's fun. Um, but I know I've, even the little tiny step up into that second turn, I cased it this year and I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. that's what cost me my win. So it's like <laughs> the tiniest thing on the track. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think coming out of that second corner and just like, taking a deep breath, you're already, you know, you've been full gas for whatever it is, 15, 16 seconds already. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got to strap in for a, a long technical third straight. So I think resetting in that moment and that tight, tight corner there um, and just choosing your line smart through there is important. Um, so yeah, I'd probably stay there. Um, but I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's pretty funny. The step up out of the last turn, used to just scare the crap out of me forever. Ever since London 2012. I was going to say, so that sounds like a trigger <laughs> moment from London. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it took me a while to get over that one. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, and like I said, there's really no spot in particular that it's like, I'm home or, oh, this is tough. It's just kind of the whole thing. You got to stay in it mm -hmm. the whole lap. And yeah. I think that's part of why it's so cool to win there, you know, uh, yeah. because, you do have to be an all around good rider to, to make it happen there. And there's always passing on that track. There's always, it's just always a good race. Well, yeah. I mean, you could win from any lane on that track. Uh, you're not safe. Yeah. You're not safe anywhere on that track. And those are huge efforts. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how, like how much more effort it is to get around that track versus, versus a rock Hill versus a Manchester? You know, Manchester is kind of its own thing because it is so short. True. Um, it might be more stressful in Manchester for other reasons, though. Yes, I think there's a lot going on in Manchester yep. for other reasons. You're just trying to, like, dodge every bullet around yep. you um, and get it clear. Um, but I think that, yeah, like, physically it is it is draining. Um, but it, that does give you a little bit of downhill help, which mm -hmm. is nice. Like, whereas somewhere like Rock Hill – it's no, there's no free speed, you know? And yeah. so there, there, it's different. Um, I would say that Papandale is probably even more mentally taxing than Rock Hill is physically taxing. Um, okay. Just on your legs in particular. Yeah. Sense, okay. You know? Cause Rock Hill's uh, flat. Yeah. You just, I think that that's kind of the, the token USA racing style, you know, there's no free speed anywhere. And um, I know foreigners really struggle when they come, race on those style tracks because pretty much everywhere else we go you know there's a downhill portion to it or you know somehow the jumps are yeah even tight. even the jumps yeah yeah right on european tracks there's there's barely any flat between like especially in a rhythm it's section but rock hill like rock. in like think about when you go race the grand nationals for usa bmx the jumps are built more round and yeah. always longer than they look and it's bumpy and rough and there's just you have to work for every ounce of speed you get whereas i think a little bit of like pop and doll is keeping the momentum you know yeah yeah kind of terraces um, down yeah and if you can lose a lot but you can also just hold momentum if you just get it get it right right so, so watching rock i mean i've never ridden pop and doll so watching Papandal, like what would be something on that track that most people assume is one way, but it's not the, like, you know, like as far as a turn or maybe a lip on a jump or just like, I assumed it was a, it was a, a more physically demanding than it was. Yeah, not that I'm it's not. not. Yeah, it I, no, I get that, not. but it's more than it was, but just, you know, those, cause all the tracks look really perfect on, you know, when you're watching it on the yeah. screen. Um, I think they fixed the last turn used to be a big issue. Um, mm -hmm. and you couldn't really see that from camera, but I remember I crashed so hard in Papandal 20. Well, there, there were a lot of crashes in the last turn. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's, there was like, um, kind of what it transitions from the dirt to the, the asphalt mm -hmm. uh, or cement. Uh, yeah. there was like this little kicker in there and then. <laughs> And that, that wasn't that it was kind of slick as well because it was uh -huh. old uh, cement and 
I, I think, yeah, if you didn't watch it, it'd like kick your back end up as you're coming into it. It was almost like you had to like bunny hop this little mm-hmm. roller in the turn that you can't see if you're just watching it on camera. Right, right. Um, so, and that really, you know, it depends where you were on the track of where you hit the lump on there and stuff. But, and, and even um, uh, as far as a jump goes, um, I think that, you know, the last straight looks all easy um, comparatively, but it's pretty steep. Mm-hmm. And you've got to get those jumps right. Um, right. So you can lose a lot on their last straight there. Um, as goes for, you know, even the step up on the women's side. Uh, on the second straight that I was talking about. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a really short, steep jump. And yeah. when you go down the backside, you're going down the backside. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So you don't want to want to be overshooting that too much. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Um, when, I, I like when I watch practice, because sometimes I'm down track level. Yeah. When I watch practice at, at Papendal, I notice that if if you're on the – the women's side, and if you, they're not, the women's side is not, they're not small jumps. No. But on on, on no, any I other think, track, it, it's like a good size jump. Yeah, I think that that's one thing with supercross tracks in general. I think that on TV or pictures, it doesn't really do it justice with how fast people are going mm-hmm. or how big the jumps actually are. I always, when I have friends that, you know, aren't involved in the sport and they want to see the training center or something here. I mean, I always take them out and I'm like, you know, walk down on the track, stand on the ramp. And that mm-hmm. actually gives some perspective right. as to like how big this stuff is. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely bigger than you would expect. But, you know, like on a track like Poppendale, you're going so fast that even riding it, it's not really, you know, there used to be a double. Like when I won in 2012, there was a a double into the second corner instead of how mm-hmm. they've changed it now. And that double was actually way bigger than it looked. I remember casing that so many times. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very, um, yeah, well, it was not what you thought it was when you went up to it. But yeah, I, I think, uh, I think all super cross tracks kind of have that, um, you know, facade of, you know, looking smaller or easier than they really are. Well, I mean, but that's also a testament to how well, how well, you all ride them, ride the tracks. I mean, you, you do make it seem like, oh yeah, I got that one. And then you go down there, or if you're on the hill, like I, I mean, you, us, me being one of the test guinea pigs of Supercross back in the day, I mean, I used to joke, it's like, man, no matter, no matter how windy it is or isn't, it always feels windy at the top of the hill. It does, yeah. And uh, yeah, I... I'll never forget in that same here another when I had in Sweden. I mean, even, and even in Shepherd in this in mm-hmm. 2020, like the wind is crazy sometimes. Like if you, and if you want to say it doesn't affect stuff, like you're crazy because you, even the I didn't really think that it would affect hill times necessarily that mm-hmm. much. Um, but when you looked at Shepherdton on day two times compared to day one, pe- and uh, we also raced in like you know, 115 degrees the day before. A bit warm, so a bit warm that weekend, yeah. <laughs> but also the, the wind, it was nuts. There was this one lap where there was a massive headwind. And I, it took us almost three seconds to get down the hill. It was nuts. And I was, wow. I was like, wow. I mean, that, I mean, there's no way everyone across the chart just lost that for that lap. Right. And, you know, had to. We all can't be that slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it changed for that one lap that much. So... Yeah, I don't know. I think all those factors, I mean, you don't see them. And even on, like, a smaller track, you probably don't notice it as much. But when you go on the top of the 8-meter, like you said, it's like things just got a lot riskier up here. It got a lot windier up here. But yeah, I think that's part of the game. You get used to, obviously, racing at that level mm-hmm. and and knowing your own limits a little bit. And I think just embracing the challenge of it a little bit, there's usually a way that you can maneuver your bike. Mm-hmm. or something to to counteract it but mm-hmm. you know you're also relying on the seven other people to do that well as well so i think full it just, trust full send yeah exactly so i think yeah it's a the riders i mean have taken it to a new level um since yeah. obviously the in our sure. supercross races it's it's just progressed um as, uh, across the charts but yeah i think you never want to send someone out down the hill uh 
without you know knowing that they know know what they're doing or know what to expect a little bit because even though the bottom of the hill is something that I don't think people who don't ride can understand the mm -hmm. the gravitational and the, the so g's kind of the that g's, you go yeah. to the bottom. Um, like so many people, risk risk takers, you know, athletes are like, oh, I want to go out on the track and I want to do this or. And it's like, I don't think that you couldn't, you know, make it over the jump if, you know, you got through here. But I think most people would just get sucked into their bike and just eject off the next well, jump because it all happens. So. Well, I got to tell you, like, progression is crazy because I remember there was a time in Supercross where most tracks, like, pedaling before the – like, once you hit the flat part, even pedaling before that first jump, unless there was a lot of space, was kind of like – a no-go. Um, it's like, no, that's like, I'm not doing that. You, you know, and I think Steven Cesar back in the day, like he started doing that on the Beijing track in um, yeah. Jura. And then we just were like, oh. It only takes one. Yeah, and just to get that pedal. And then, and, but now, I mean, you're, there's certain places on the circuit where people are pedaling through the transition. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's like a, so, so I guess what I'm saying is, there's a whole skill and art form and science to the gate to the first jump before you even get take off the ground, exactly. which is amazing I think, to me. I think the jumping is almost the easiest part of the whole thing. You know, it's the takeoff here, land there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot. Yeah, of that's like the only part where you can go. All right. Oh, I gotta you go again. After I can take a breath. I, I'm a triple and pop and off. All right. Here yeah. We go. <laughs> peek, peek over. Yeah. Exactly. So you you mentioned speed. Do you know how, do you know the numbers on the speed down the first straight? Um, well, all I know is that in like, in, in K's that we'd probably hit around anywhere like women's side of it, probably 57 to 60 K, um, towards the bottom of the hill. And then depends on the track, whether you gain speed or, yeah. or <laughs> that's fast. <laughs> that's yeah, fast. So that's like 35, 40 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's fast. So um, I've been speculating, and I think some other people have. But what do you think about this? Um, do you see a point in the very near future where there will be no women's, no women's side? There will just be a track. I think I do, personally. Well, they're, they're I mean... They're transitioning away from the berm jumps and like the second straight being different because I think that requires two separate straights. Mm -hmm. um, and you're seeing the third straights be a separate. But I, I do think that there's always going to be tracks with a separate men's side somewhere on the track. Just from the physical standpoint of it. Okay. I don't know. I because I'm watching some videos and there's I'm seeing a lot of women hit a lot of big jumps. And um, I'm not saying that women can't. I I love hitting No, I know. I, I get um, that. But I think that it would it would it'll be a long time before we would see that because at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's one thing to hit a big jump by yourself with a Oops. rolling start doing whatever in practice and right. then whole another thing to do it eight laps seven in a row with seven other people around you you know that's always been the argument too of um you know as the women's cl class has gotten you know deeper and deeper um yeah of competitive level you know it used to be you know we don't want you know there's going to be three girls that want to hit this but then there's going to be you know five that don't in the race and then it looks bad for tv to do it that way right so i think that that's still there. It mm -hmm. just, you know, um, because of the race jumbling, how it does. Like, not you're not going to get a clear shot every mm -hmm. time you go. And and the, just from the physicality standpoint of it, like I know I work my butt off and I can do a lot of things like the boys, but you know, you get 35 seconds deep into a lap, and men are still going to have a little bit more power than than women are to be able to get up and over a bigger jump. Well. Fair enough, but I can tell you that throughout the history of BMX racing, mm -hmm. I can think of three women where men were scared to get on the gate with those women, and you're one of them. Oh, thank you. Yeah. 
Now, granted, that's, it's horsepower. That's just, Palmer, that's just because Palmer knows that the world's in Zold and my time was pretty close to his. <laughs> hey, speed is speed. <laughs> speed is speed. Like, I'm, I'm not kidding. hating. I'm just saying, like, that's... You, do, you, do you want to take a guess at who those other two women might be? Just Shanae's for fun? Shanae's. Yeah. Sure. Um, We're going to go back. We got to go way back for this one, but keep going. And Carol? No. No. But scared to go around a turn with Ann Caro, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. How, how far back are we going? We're Way going, back? we're going, we're going to go back to the 80s, actually. Gosh, I don't know my history well yeah. enough, but like, I, Sherry Elliott comes to yeah. mind. Yep. Okay. You got it. All right. <laughs> yeah, you, you would know it. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, been... and like, the, there are standouts. There, there are. Um, and there's always going to be you know people that you know can push that edge and that envelope a little bit but to keep it competitive and right. to keep it, you know i just don't foresee that changing anytime soon and like i just think about even on the tokyo test track it, <laughs> that third straight is hard enough for the women to yeah. get through it looked really like a really physical track really flat really big yeah. really long yeah well, 50 second lap time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. But yeah, yeah like, I just don't see, you know, there's still a physical difference there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people want to see big jumps. And I think, you know, they're going to keep doing that as much as they can. All right. All right. Well, cool. That was a fun conversation. I never asked that question before. Yeah. So, was well, there anything else? What's on your mind? Anything you want to get off your chest? Not that it has to be a gripe session, but it's fun to talk to you. It's fun to see people from BMX. I know. Yeah, I just hope everyone's hanging tough. I know it's tough times, like you said, stuck at home. We're used to traveling. Mm -hmm. We, me and Sam, were joking about it because um, when we got back from uh, Australia earlier this year, uh, and then had to go to Houston, he didn't even want to go to Houston for the national championship. He's like, I'm just ready to stay home. And you know what? After Tokyo, I'm not going anywhere for like, at I'm going to stay at the same place for at least six months. Right. And then now here we are. And he's like, I think I could travel again. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Go. <laughs> he got his so, wish. I, be careful. <laughs> yeah. Be careful what you wish for. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, it's been actually, uh, kind of a nice break from travel on that note. Um, but, you know, obviously it's unfortunate circumstances yep. and uh, changes a lot for a lot of people. But I hope everybody's uh, hanging tough and, and making the most of it. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Well, I do appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And hopefully we will um, all be at a BMX event sooner rather than later. Yes. We hope to see you there. All right. Take <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> Take care. All right. See ya. Bye.